Support for sustainability defined comes from NLX, the makers of Juicebox, the best selling electric car home charging station. The Juicebox smart charger enables EV drivers to charge their cars with the cleanest and cheapest energy available. More online at juiceboxstore.com. All right, Definers, welcome back to Sustainability Defined, where Scott and I are here defining sustainability, one concept and one bad joke at a time. This, my friends, is an updated episode 16 in which we focus on sustainable beer with Scott, one of our all-time favorite guests on the podcast, and we know beloved by many Definers out there, Katie Wallace of New Belgium Brewery. So smart, so nice. She's the best. So cool. I mean, we don't live too far away. I'm trying to say when we can go hang out, grab a beer outside, you know, Mm -hmm. because she's just that awesome of a person. So tell us, Scott, why are we replaying this episode? Why are folks this lucky? (laughs) Exactly. Well, first of all, we should say that we did have a new episode lined up for this month, but due to scheduling issues, we had to delay it to next month. So you'll see a brand new episode next month. But we wanted to bring this update to you for several reasons. One, we saw that New Belgium had some very cool sustainability news, which you'll hear from Katie. We had the opportunity to talk with Katie again. She's a very busy person, so we wanted to take advantage of that. Uh, And also, this is a very popular episode. A lot of people have downloaded it. I think it pairs nicely with the Sustainability and Spirits episode from late last year. Also, uh, a nice beer. I think it pairs nicely with that, wouldn't you say, Jay? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I wish I could say I had a fat tire in my hand right now, but that will be pretty darn good. Yeah. All right. And hopefully in a can. Is that right, Jay? Of, of Scott, as if I would drink it out of anything else. No, there you go. Anymore. All right. Well, Definers, we will see you next month for a brand new episode. But in the meantime, enjoy this update to episode 16 that was on sustainable beer. Cheers. Support for Sustainability Defined comes from NLX, the makers of Juicebox, the best-selling electric car home charging station. The Juicebox can charge an EV up to 13 times faster than other home charging stations. Juicebox's smart charging Wi-Fi features also help drivers charge with the cheapest and cleanest energy available. Schedule car charging when electricity rates are lower, or with JuiceNet Green software, charge with the cleanest energy on the grid. Sync your EV charging to times when solar and wind power are at maximum production, and fossil fuel power sources are at a minimum. More online at juiceboxstore.com. All right, listeners, we have Katie Wallace. We got her back, the infamous Katie Wallace. So thank you, Katie, for joining us again to update on what's going on with you, with New Belgium, some of the things you mentioned in our episode way back in 2016. So thanks for joining us again. So fun to be back with you all over virtual beers this time instead of real life, but um, nonetheless. Nonetheless, we will we will go on. And first of all, we want to congratulate you, Katie, on your promotion that you're now the director of social and environmental impact. I know when we last talked, you were assistant director of sustainability. So, you know, director. There's the addition of the social component. So, congrats. Thank you so much. As if your original job, Katie, couldn't have gotten any cooler somehow. Right? Yeah. It just did. Yeah. yeah um, new horizons for everybody in the sustainability <laughs> field these days. <laughs> so, I mean, Katie, tell us, I mean, about the new role. Are there any other Katie Wallace updates? I know we have a lot of just diehard Katie Wallace fans amongst our Aww. definers, we're calling them now. So and we love an update generally on Katie. Yeah, totally. Um, it's been a wild few years. Um we, I took this role a couple of years ago and um, actually sit on our executive team. And um, we have an, a new CEO since we spoke last um, mm. and, um, and a new VP of marketing that's really excited about how we leverage the brand platform for positive impact. And so, so a lot of like wonderful second generation leadership at New Belgium that's really supportive of our values and kind of carrying this torch forward in a new way, but also a bigger scalable way that, um, you know, I think it's really interesting because we did this as we were like growing up as a small company in a booming industry. But now the fact that we have this leadership that's taking it to the next level as we become more of a national brand and 
bigger company um, is just really exciting. Um, I will say also that I added in um, a function on our team. Of, um, hopefully you can cut this. <laughs> Sorry. Is that your is that your dog back there? No, I don't want to cut that at all. I think that's an important update too. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> all right. She just got back from a hike with some friends. She just got dropped off, so she's coming Rough to life. say hi. I know, right? Um, so so anyway, we added diversity, equity, and inclusion, and really um, kind of looked at the intersection of all of our environmental, social, and community work, um, and really have I think a nice integrated. Um, intersectional strategy. Hmm. So that strategy sounds exciting. And we've seen a couple new things come out as you act on that strategy. So one is that we read that New Belgium earned the first carbon neutral certified beer in North America via Fat Tire. Yeah. And as part of that, you had this ismybeersustainable.com, which I, I only looked at it briefly, but it was like a drop down menu. And I assume if I choose any other beer other than Fat Tire, it'll say no, <laughs> because it'll... That's no, the, true, the but hopefully not high. for long. Yeah. <laughs> probably not for long. So tell us about those uh, innovations and anything else new in New Belgium you want to tell us about. Great. Yeah. Um, so more of the details around our carbon neutral certification are actually at drinksustainably.com. We really nerd out there for mostly for your audience and others like them. So we are really more excited about the idea of carbon neutral certification and what that means. I think for a while we were kind of like questioning, like, what's the efficacy of offsets? And, um, you know, what are we saying when we say we're carbon neutral? We don't want to promote a platform that, um, that encourages action that could not be truly meaningful to the climate. And I think that mm -hmm. within today's carbon neutral certification sphere in the United States, there's, you can still kind of claim carbon neutral without going through the rigorous steps that make it meaningful. Mm -hmm. So other countries have different federal standards and we're learning a lot um, with our from international partners about what that can look like and um, really hoping that um, the U.S. sets a national standard that holds everyone to a, a high bar that's truly meaningful in the fight against climate change. Um, but we're really... Um, you know, at this point, building a toolkit um, to get to help more brewers down the path of carbon neutral and so like not uh, really just you, Bill, hoping... you want to help other brewers. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is kind of like not everyone has a sustainability team like New Belgium and nor does it make sense for every brewery, especially the smaller ones. And so why not just um, share our learnings and our mm. playbook, essentially, in the standards that we think are important to uphold in this type of um, certification you know, why not share that with everyone else just to accelerate everybody's adoption of it? Because again, this is like one of those examples where if New Belgium alone is successful, we don't necessarily hit the end goal of um, stabilizing the climate, right? We re re really need everyone to act. And did you say who, who did the certification? SCS Global Services did our certification. Um, they have a long history of certifications. Um, we really liked the high standard that um, they uphold for carbon neutral, but they also do things like when you see the gluten-free certification or the GMO-free. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they have a long history of really um, rigorous standards and, um, and hold us to the standard that the other um, companies and nations across the world are really setting at this point. And then it's fat tire. Do you, are you going to work on other brands as well? Is that the plan for the future? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, we're actually, we have one more beer um, coming out, uh, Mountain Time Lager. Don't tell anybody yet. <laughs> no, um, Mountain Time Lager is, um, going, is going to be finalized, I think, in about a week. Um, and then we have a goal to add all beers in by 2030, so that by 2030, we are 100% carbon neutral across the board with um, the entire life cycle of all of our products. Um, we have a number of initiatives that don't that um, are driving down direct emissions. As a part of SCS Global's uh, mm -hmm. certification, we actually have to show year over year reductions in our direct emissions um, in order to maintain our certification. So we can't just like write checks every year for offsets and call it a day. They wanna see transformative action within our uh, value chain. And so we have like big projects um, internally for energy efficiency and renewable energy. And they're about to roll out a big supplier program where we actually sponsor a consultant that helps to find um, financially beneficial ways for our suppliers to move towards renewable energy. There is truly no shortage of exciting things coming out of <laughs> New Belgium. I mean, man, for years, busy. you guys <laughs> have been have been very, very busy. 
Katie, I want to actually transition us now as we get closer to replaying this episode. We touched on all kinds of cool things in the episode that we would be curious just to get some updates on you from. So the first one was, and this one has always stood out to me, you guys, for a time, this is again, back in 2016, you used to be purchasing wind power at a premium as a source of energy. And around that time, decided to leave that program due to this extra cost and instead put that money into an internal energy tax, which I just think is a very fascinating just case study in, in sustainable business beyond just sustainable beer you know, in the first place. But the question is, do you guys still have this internal energy tax? And if so, how has it evolved since four and a half years ago? Great. Yeah, great question. Um, so I will say just first of all, that it's always going to be more efficient and um, and more effective if we can transform the grid versus just creating all of our own energy on site, right? Um, there's a lot more efficiency when we can all work together at the grid level. And so that's always been our goal. And the reason that we got into that wind program was back in uh, the late 90s, our coworkers uh, voted unanimously to give up profit sharing so that we could bring wind power to Fort Collins, Colorado for the first time. It was a really exciting time. And um, and that way we were kind of you know paying into the grid. We even invested enough to even um, add an, an extra turbine to their project and um, and really exciting times. And then over the years, the demand for, for that within the, um, the utilities outpaced the supply of renewable energy within our grid. So it ended up becoming for a while like renewable energy credits, um, you know, that were going to other states. And we just thought, you know, as the sum of money on our part grew, um, it was actually about that time, like a quarter of a million dollars. And we thought, hey, why, instead of shipping a quarter of a million dollars to other states for renewable energy credits, like let's see, let's make some direct investments in our own facilities since, you know, so that we can transform our direct grid. And so, um, so with that money, we bought new solar panels, we improved insulation and um, process efficiency throughout the brewery. And um, did some lighting retrofits and various things. Um, we also added some projects into our new brewery in Asheville as we built that up to be LEED certified. Um, so it was a great program at that time. And I think with, with this, we're always kind of like hopping to the next lily pad to see what's making the biggest impact um, with mm-hmm. what we can offer. And, um, and we've seen some really awesome changes since then. So, um, so we actually still do have the, the tax, but we are getting ready to um, transition that back into renewable energy credits in our home grid. Um, the city of Fort Collins, with with a lot of our advocacy, um, uh, voted to go 100% renewable electricity by 2030. And so that's great. So now that money is going back to local projects within our own grid and making some direct emissions reductions within New Belgium's economy. And we're really excited about that shift that's coming up and um, you know, it gets really nerdy, but really important to kind of stay on your toes and figure out where your buck can make the biggest bang. And always um, when possible, we're looking at grid transformation versus just, no, and you know, the and you need those reductions, on-site. right. To, to meet your carbon neutrality goal. You like you said, you have to keep making yeah. those reductions. Yep. Yeah. It's never, you know, if, if, if you're in an office building and you don't have grid opportunities, I always think like, you know, reach out to your utilities and um, and your city, whoever runs that, and advocate for them to have a renewable energy goal. But meanwhile, even if you're purchasing recs and they're going out of state, it's all helping the cause overall. But you're right, like um, we do need those direct emissions reductions. And so we're really prioritizing home grid. And luckily today we have more opportunity to do that. Excellent. That's really cool. And again, touching all these larger topics here and, and how New Belgium can play a role really, really inspiring. Next question. You mentioned back in 2016, these unique brew kettles that you were using that could capture and then use the steam that comes off of them as a more efficient system as you guys are making your beer. Any other innovations at your brewery since 2016 to make them more efficient and reduce their impact? Yeah, we, um, so we still do quite a bit of uh, heat capture and capture about 85% of the heat in our brewing process, which is amazing. And then we also applied all of those principles to our Asheville brewery when we set up a second brewery in Asheville, North Carolina. And, um, and so we made some improvements to those um, based off of what we learned in the Fort Collins uh, brewery system. Um, and we also designed the Asheville brewery to be much tighter, um, you know, reducing length 
um, of piping in between processes and just having a much tighter um, op operation than you know the, the one that is in Fort Collins that we kind of pieced together over the years. And so it, the actual brewery inherently will be more energy efficient just because of the way we designed it intentionally. And um, and so that that's a big one for sure. It's LEED certified, like I said earlier. Um, but other than that, just a lot of nerdy, nerdy details um, that aren't, they don't come in easy sound bites anymore, but um, a lot of people doing amazing work to kind of optimize um, our brewing process, reduce dump beer that has a lot of embodied energy and ingredients and water in it. Um, and then optimize all of our- beer? Brewing. What is that? Like just beer that didn't come out right and then you got to get rid of it? Yeah. Tragedy, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, it should be like, it's like immoral or illegal at least or something, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, there's um, sometimes, uh, well, there's two two reasons we have dump beer. One is because there's a quality issue, which we, um, you know, the better you get at predicting quality issues and um, getting ahead of them, the, the less dumped beer you have. Um, but um, it's oftentimes best when you can figure that out, though, before it goes into the bottle or can, which oftentimes does happen. Um, but anyway, we have less and less of that just with a great quality assurance program. But then the other thing is like when you're pushing beer through pipes um, and cleaning out tanks, um, is there a different way to push that that doesn't leave as much um, kind of lagging in the pipes that ends up getting dumped? And so just really nerdy, nerdy details on like how we move liquid around our brewery so that when we're pushing it, we're pushing maybe just water rather than all of the wort yeah. which is unfermented beer or the beer and therefore losing a lot more embodied energy in it so i do want to ask about one more thing you brought up in the episode so you mentioned that new belgium gave one dollar for every barrel of beer so that's like 31 gallons uh, that you sold and you gave those that dollar and the money raised to things like smart development and bite advocacy is that still the case uh can people still apply through your website for grants and do the employees still choose where the grants go yeah, we still have our dollar per barrel program. So for every barrel of beer we sell, we put a dollar in a philanthropy fund. And um, and we also are certified by 1% for the planet. Um, and then we do have a grant cycle that's open to the public for bicycle advocacy. Um, but we also kind of evolved our grants program as it grew to be more sizable um, to move away from some of those smaller donations of like $1,000, $2,000. And then offering, um, you know, ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollar donations to some bigger organizations that are really strategically pushing um, towards the same goals that New Belgium has. Um, we give in three primary categories. Um, one is around climate action, you know, including all land and water protection, um, as well as diversity, equity, and inclusion. Really focused on the beer world um, and the outdoor community, which we're really a part of, and then. Um, Finally, just kind of community resilience in the face of natural disasters or COVID shutdowns, et cetera. Mm. So, um, so some of the cool projects that we've done in the last year, um, we're giving to like Outdoor Alliance um, for some of their work. They're really promoting this um, goal to protect public lands um, as, as um, also, you know, with climate benefits. Um, and then we are um, giving bigger grants to um, the Next 100 Coalition out of Colorado that's um, defining what the next 100 years will look like in the outdoors and really aiming to diversify that and see more people, different faces, different identities out in the outdoors. So like, for example, one of the groups that benefited from that inclusive journeys, um, they're creating a guide for all for um, people of color to let them know where they can go play outside, what communities in the mountains, et cetera are really um, safe and friendly for um, communities of color. So um, so just supporting our friends that are doing cool work in that space. And then we also um, actually raised over $300,000 um, with a bar and restaurant re relief fund um, right when the pandemic started and bar and restaurant workers were laid off. Um, they didn't have any stimulus coming in. People are living paycheck to paycheck. We got checks in their hands with um, within like six weeks and um, got raised a bunch of money from other companies as well to pay out to those that had been laid off um, in, the, in the bar and restaurant world. So, so really looking across the board and looking at the intersections between climate, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and um, community resilience as a part of our giving program. Um, but the one thing that we do have that intersects all of those actually is the Bicycle Advocacy Grant Cycle, 
which is open actually um, next month. Excellent. Well, Katie, truly so many things going on over on New Belgium side. It seems like you guys have really scaled up, taken that next step since we last spoke with you. So definers coming up, let's get back to basics and, and trace back where this journey started here with Katie. But Katie, thanks again for checking in with us, giving us this awesome update, re- reassuring us that New Belgium Fat Tire, still my favorite beer, is as sustainable as ever. And we can't wait to see what's next for you guys coming up down the road. Thanks so much, Scott and Jay. It's just, it's really fun to be hanging out with y'all and hope to cross paths with you and the other definers out there in the near future. Yes. Thanks so much, Katie. Thanks, Katie. All right. Thanks, y'all. Bye-bye. All right, listeners, welcome to my bedroom. (laughs) That's where we are recording this. Uh, Infamous last words. (laughs) That sounded really, uh, like... That was like dark, a sinister. Murder. <laughs> Welcome to my bedroom. <laughs> so, this is episode 16. Uh, this is on sustainable beer. And this is uh, the first in our series of interviews that we did at the Net Impact Conference. Uh, we did it in a different order at the conference, but we're going to air them in a different order uh, at the request of uh, one of our interviewees. So... This is a great episode. Jay, tell us what the intro is going to cover. Yeah, well, and maybe for some context, uh, for some listeners who didn't catch episode 15, we were lucky enough to go to the Net Impact Conference in Philadelphia. Um, And Net Impact not only gave us free passes to get there, but also hooked us up with some of their speakers that they had uh, all throughout the weekend. And so these next three episodes, uh, including this one with Katie Wallace, are speakers we got to meet while there and just ask them about their sustainability initiatives and whatever they're doing. So it's a really, really cool opportunity. Yeah. So, uh, and now listeners, I know the last episode was kind of, uh, you know, just what's going on with this organization and whatnot, but it was, I, we still think it was worthwhile. And now these, uh, these episodes, we wouldn't be able to do otherwise without it. Right. And now we get to talk about sustainable beer. So what else can you ask for really? So what are we covering in the intro? Yeah. So first we're going to walk through a couple fast facts on the beer industry. Then we are going to ask ourselves how you actually make sustainable beer. We'll then go through a list of sustainable beer companies to help guide us throughout our drinking excursion. Uh, then dive into sustainability at New Belgium Brewery specifically, and then wrap it up with a little bit of an intro to Katie. And if you want, as we cover those, you can take a shot after each one. You can make a drinking game of this, (laughs) right? Yeah, that means we'd be, what, five deep by the time the interview actually starts? Yeah. (laughs) I'm sure they'll enjoy the episode more, probably. I'm sure. All right, so fast facts on the beer industry. In 2015... The U.S. beer industry sold 206.7 million barrels of beer. That's uh, more than 2.8 billion cases of 24 packs. Uh, the in- industry also shipped about 2 million barrels of cider, so about 10% of what it did in beer. And that's pretty good. Cider's a growing segment, um, and I love it. Also, in 2015, 85% of all the beer was domestically produced. Uh, so... That's kind of more than I thought, just because you think about Guinness and all the other right, beers. Right, right. But yeah. Uh, and try to like wrap your head around this number. The U.S. beer industry sells more than $100 billion in beer and malt-based beverages to U.S. consumers every year. I wonder how much of that is the malt-based. It's. It, I would guess not that much. Yeah. But I have no basis for that. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk breweries. So there were... 4,824 reporting brewery facilities slash locations in the United States in 2015. That's an increase of 700 from 2014. So that's pretty amazing, that kind of growth. Uh, A quarter of them were classified as brew pubs, which means they're selling beers direct to consumers at the restaurant. Um, So I don't know if I would get in a – I don't know if I'd do a brewery now. It's almost like getting too big. You think so? Yeah, I feel like it's no like two years cool. ago it was the way to, it was the thing to do. <laughs> Styles I, change. I want to do a cidery. That'd be awesome. You heard it here first, folks. Have you been to the new one in DC? Uh, no, but I know you have. No, I have not yet. I thought you, I thought you took a date there or something. Uh, that date didn't happen. Uh, That's another story. <laughs> I'll tell you later. <laughs> and craft beer is getting more popular. Since 2009, more than seven percent of the market has shifted from large brewers and importers to smaller brewers and importers. There's actually a great podcast episode of How I Built This that features Jim Coke, who is the founder of Sam Adams Brewery, which is a super interesting look into how he kind of like started this whole craft brewery movement. 
Yeah, I I love that that podcast. You all should check it it's out. How amazing. I built this. It, yeah. The flow of that. If we can get half. As good as that, yeah. Podcast. Well, and, and, and Scott, I think you've got a Guy Raz type voice. I don't mean to flatter you too much <sighs> on air here, but uh, it's pretty, it's pretty nice. Thanks, man. I love how his name is Guy too. <laughs> like the and the guests are always like, "Thanks, Guy." <laughs> <laughs> I say that as a joke. Like, thanks, generic person. But. Um, all right, Scott. Let's talk quickly about how we actually make sustainable beer. And it occurred to me as, as we were going through this research that making sustainable beer is much like making any other kind of sustainable product where you're looking at uh, locally sourced materials that are used. You're looking at the energy used and actually producing it. And then you're looking at the company to see if it's actually structured in a sustainable way. And in this intro, we're going to focus on locally sourced materials, the most flavorful component of your beer. We'll be talking to Katie of New Belgium about the other two. So materials used in beer, really simple. Barley, hops, yeast, and water before adding in all the fancy stuff on top. Right, to get all your, your optimal wits and stuff. So of those ingredients, hops might be the hardest to source locally. It's mainly done in the Pacific Northwest. But even when breweries use ingredients that are far away, they're trying to find ways to incorporate local ingredients. We read about one brewery that's using New York honey in its beer. Yeah, and water is obviously something you can probably source locally too. Uh, I'm really trying to make that that footprint a little bit smaller from the brewery. Um, so how about let's talk about actually sustainable beer companies as we're moving forward and maybe give us an idea of maybe which beers to to gravitate towards next time we go to the store. I feel like I'm David Letterman right now. The top top 10. 10 sustainable. Yeah. Think back. Did you see Years of Living Dangerously? Mm-hmm. You know that show? No. Where the, so it's the show where um, celebrities report on climate change. And it's on no, National this Geographic. sounds right up our alley. Yeah, I was watching it. David Letterman reports from India about their energy use. If you all haven't seen it, it's on, it's on demand. They're getting You're... show recommendations, podcast recommendations. We're proving our worth. All and now top 10 beer. So here we go. <laughs> top 10 sustainable beer companies. And then Paul <clears throat> Schaefer plays me in. Okay, yeah, yeah. so number 10, Great Lakes Brewing Company. Number 9, <laughs> Bison Organic Beers. Number 8, Alaskan Brewing Company. In 1998, it became the first craft brewery in the U.S. to install and operate the CO2 reclamation system. Tip of the hat to Alaskan Brewing Company. Tasty. Number seven, Brewery Vivant. Number six, Lakefront Brewery, which was the first in the U.S. to produce a certified organic beer, which is a category that hasn't really taken off, we read, because it's expensive and, and no you, cha- no difference in taste. Yeah, people just don't love it, um, unfortunately. Number five is Full Sail Brewing. Number four is Sierra Nevada Brewing Company. Number three is Brooklyn Brewery, which was the first New York City company to use 100% wind-generated electricity. Number two is Yards Brewing Company. And number one is New Belgium. And we are, again, lucky enough to speak with Katie Wallace of New Belgium coming up in a little bit. You don't want to read what you put there in parentheses? I didn't bring this. I said, hey oh hey oh hey oh <laughs> All right. So sustainable at, sustainability at New Belgium Brewery. Take a shot if you're playing along with the with the drinking game. Uh, new category. So reuse. Uh, new Belgium reuses the barley once they've extracted all the starches and sugars from it. They also use this really uniquely built cone-shaped kettle to cook the grains that go into the beer, uh, which uses 65% less energy than a traditional unit. So New Belgium also uses a steam capture to capture the steam coming off the brew kettle, and then it uses that steam to preheat the incoming water, reducing the amount of energy needed to start the next next batch of beer. All right, Scott, let me ask the question that's on all of our listeners' minds. How can you, as a beer lover, drink more sustainably? Okay, well, one is drink locally because then they produce it. They don't have to ship it as far. Um, uh, And then it also pumps money back into the community. And then I think third is that you have to think about which breweries are taking sustainability seriously. So we listed 10 for you, but, um, you know, read up on the companies, see what they're putting on their packaging, that sort of thing. And it doesn't hurt that Fat Tire by New Belgium is just a phenomenal beer. Mm-hmm. Didn't Katie say that was her favorite? No, she didn't. No, I no think she, she was... liked the sour ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Saisons, maybe. Yeah, and then she may or may not have corrected you on the fact that it is an old brewery technique. Right, right. You were like, oh, that's so new. She's like, actually, uh, that's the oldest one of the oldest. beer <laughs> around. Um... <laughs> Clearly, I don't work uh, at New Belgium. Um, but let's talk a little bit about Katie before we kick it over to our interview with her. She is the Assistant Director of Sustainability at New Belgium Brewing Company, which is based in Fort Collins, Colorado. She has a Master's in Applied Positive Psychology. I love that. Yeah. God, that just sounds I'm cheerful. I'm smiling you just know? thinking about it. <laughs> uh, which she got from University of Pennsylvania 
And she says that this helps her provide a scientific understanding of human flourishing and hopefully beer flourishing too. So at New Belgium, Katie devises the strategic direction of sustainability efforts, facilitates collaborative problem solving, and drives progress on established goals. She also serves on New Belgium's management team and does consulting for other businesses on the side. Not a bad gig. Not a bad gig. Let's find out what else she has to say. Cheers. All right, Scott, this is the second of our Net Impact Series interviews with highly esteemed guests that are here speaking and kind of just sharing their stories about sustainability. So we are here with Katie Wallace of New Belgium Brewery, excited to talk to her about sustainable beer and initiatives that are going on inside her company, making New Belgium one of the most sustainable breweries out there. Katie, thanks for joining us. Hi, guys. Great yeah. to be here. And we were, and you just like plopped down and you just broke out a couple cold ones for us. That was awesome. <laughs> thanks, Katie. <laughs> oh, wait. That, yeah, did that happen? Oh, wait. Well, not, not yet. But I guess, Katie, okay. before we get started, the most important question is, what is your favorite beer that New Belgium brews? Oh, um, gosh, there are so many, but uh, right now it's for sure tart lychee. So that's a sour beer that we make um, fermented in the wooden fooders with uh, lychees and Vietnamese cinnamon. It's delicious. Wow. This whole sour beer thing is kind of like a newer thing, right? Uh, well, it's actually an older thing, oh, right? Is, it's like the most oblivious? ancient way, <laughs> you know, form of brewing, but it is coming back into fashion for sure these days. Excellent. All right, so Katie, when we were looking at your resume and everything you're doing, I think it occurred to us that you have what many people would call a dream job, where you're working in sustainability at an awesome brewery, um, getting your hands on all kinds of cool things. So um, could you just briefly introduce yourself and kind of walk us through the career path that led you to where you are? Sure. Um, So Katie Wallace, I've been at New Belgium for over 12 years, and, uh, and when I first started at the brewery, Sustainability was, you know, sustainability roles within companies weren't really a thing. Um, that was pretty fringe at that moment. So um, I did not realize that a sustainability manager position existed when I was planning my career. Um, and I maybe had a, a bumpy or, you know, start without a, a clear vision. I did my undergrad in finance and economics and knew since I was a little kid that I wanted to live in Australia. So I went and Went and followed that dream and managed a little restaurant on the beach there. And Wait, where in Australia? In Byron Bay, oh, in nice. Surf Town. Yeah. yeah, changed my life. A really cool place. You know, I, I had long valued uh, sustainability, but I didn't really see a way of integrating that in the world where I was exposed um, in the Midwest, where I grew up here. Um, but then going to Byron Bay, I saw you know, farm-to-table restaurants and green building and, and a big passion around uh, uh, working more elegantly with the environment. So, um, so I came back very inspired by that, you know, and, and my friends, uh, in business school and my teachers said that by not going straight into the job market, you know, throwing away my degree, I won't be a desirable <laughs> candidate, <laughs> um, when I'm done. And, uh, and so I felt like if I didn't go to Australia though, that wouldn't be a desirable candidate for my own life for myself. Well said. <laughs> and so, and it paid off really well because like you said, I do feel like I, I have a dream job right now. And I think that there is merit in really following something that you're passionate about. And in, in the beginning, it might not make a lot of sense, but things come back around um, uh, and, and sometimes make perfect sense. Okay. So you, was the Australia thing after business school? Is that what you were it getting? It was. Okay. Yeah. And then you came back. Came back. And then how'd you find the job at New Belgium? I wanted to go back to school for green building, and I had um, a nice plan to move to California and go back to school. But I, I went to a U.S. Green Building Council conference and just to scope the field and uh, met someone from New Belgium. He was our technical director at the time, and he and I chatted. I just thought it was super cool that New Belgium was wind-powered, employee-owned, and wanted to know more about that. Um, and he, he suggested that I apply for an upcoming job. Um, where I could use my existing degree and work for a company that shared my values. And I was like, no, man, I'm moving to California. <laughs> <laughs> no, man. Gosh, she already had the California there. thing down. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but I, I ended up applying just to see what it was like and went out for an interview and completely fell in love with the space and what New Belgium was doing and uh, realized how much of the real deal that it was. And I knew I wanted to be a part of it. Um, so So that original job... It was really hard to translate this on my resume (laughs) when I applied for grad school, but um, my my original job was Ranger Wrangler, 
Ranger Wrangler. Yeah. <laughs> and, and what exactly is that? Um, well, our, we call our sales people beer rangers. And at that time, we were um, pretty small. We didn't have a lot of formal communication systems in place, and we were growing to the size where we needed those. So I helped to create communication systems um, between finance and accounting and sales and branding. So kind of wrangling the rangers to get down to uh, wrangling budget the tracking. Yeah. Wow, that sounds like the Wild West. Maybe... <laughs> You know, I don't know if you guys were all wearing Wranglers while doing this, but... Oh, yeah, you know. it was a part of the job description. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice. <laughs> Luckily, um, I locked out on that one. When you say the company shares your values, I, was it from the start? Is it just the people who started it felt that way? Or was there an event where they said, we have to change how we operate? Like, tell us about the origins of sustainability at New Belgium. Sure. Uh, for us, it was um, pretty early on. So before we even sold our first beer... Our co-founders, Jeff and Kim, took a hike in Rocky Mountain National Park, and they said, these are the things that matter to us as humans, and we don't think that a business should operate by a separate set of moral guidelines. So that day, they carved into place our company purpose and our core values and beliefs, and included in those were uh, were points about how we treat the environment, how we treat one another, and uh, and that has been something that at New Belgium, uh, our founders artfully took off of a piece of a paper, off a plaque that sits on a wall, and brought it into our everyday uh, interactions with one another and, and the decisions we make as a business. Um, I would say also, uh, you know, we were founded in 1991. In 99, we had another pivotal moment for our company where we were um, approached with the opportunity to invest in wind power. And at that time, uh, the, the investment was quite large. The city wasn't quite sure that the ratepayers would accept it. We asked how much it was. Um, it, we had the money in the bank, but we had already promised it to our coworkers at prof- as profit sharing. And so we, um, at that point, Jeff and Kim didn't want to just take that away from people and generate resentment around wind power, um, but it was a great opportunity they didn't want to pass up. And so they took the decision to the coworkers, the co-owners, and at that time, um, the, the coworkers got together. 45 minutes later, they came out of the room, and they announced to Jeff and Kim that unanimously they agreed that they all wanted to give up profit sharing that year to invest in wind power. So... That's, I mean, so, I, that's so cool. Yeah, so, it, it still I mean, gives me chills. It, it, it really seems like it's clearly instilled in the company that, you know, there are larger, more important things out there that everyone is conscious of and wants to, you know, facilitate as much as possible. Yeah, and using wind power, like the benefits of that, like that's almost like something they did for everyone, mm-hmm. you know, and the cost that they're, the hit they're taking is really personal. Like that money would have went directly to them. Absolutely. So the benefit that they're seeing isn't something tangible, you know? Mm-hmm. It's something that is bigger than them. And to make that decision unanimously tells you a lot about who's working at that company. Yeah, it was a, de- a defining moment for us. Well, and, and let me ask you, because I think I saw that you guys tend to purchase wind power at a premium. Is that, is that correct? So that you're, you're maybe spending more on wind power than you otherwise would on other energy? Right. Is that still the case? Like, has that cost come down? Um, the cost has not come down uh, we uh, f- for the program that we would subscribe to anyway, but that so when we voted to bring the wind power in, we paid money up front and then we also paid an additional cost per kilowatt hour um, for every kilowatt hour we purchased. But then um, back in 2013, we actually left that program. So we no longer pay into that program. At the time when we started it and over the next um, decade and a half that we were a part of it, uh, we we thought that that was a really valuable and innovative thing to do. But the amount that we were investing at 2.4 cents per kilowatt hour, which is a, a sizable amount, um, was adding up quite a bit. And we felt like there was potentially something a little more innovative we could do with that, pro- with that money because the, the city's program was already strong, high demand for it. The residents and businesses across the town were supporting it well. And so we pulled out of it and we actually um, put that money into an internal energy tax. So we, we same, same use, we're still offsetting the environmental impact of our energy, um, but this time we're investing it internally. Right. And it's smart to realize the opportunity cost of that investment. Like mm-hmm. you put it somewhere else. So you're saying you put it into an internal tax. I've never heard of a company having that kind of internal tax. How explain the like mechanics of it? How is that? How do the decision makers see that so that it actually changes the way? Maybe give us an example of so they were thinking about something and then they thought, wait, we have that internal tax. Right. That's a huge thing, and so let's make a different decision. Sure, yeah. So the uh, our 
we charge ourselves 2.4 cents a kilowatt hour. And so the following year we get to use that budget. And, um, and there's a process, a natural resource management team that actually looks at, seeks projects that will um, use that money. So for example, we put up solar panels uh, last year f- with that money. But, um, but then there are also existing projects that people can apply for funds with. We only give the, the, the IET monies to projects that don't otherwise have a business case. So if something already we would already do in the course of a business, we, we just say, no, let's go ahead and stick with that. Um, but some some things, like for example, um, when we renovated our HVAC system in our beer cooler area, we uh, realized that if we were to add some additional insulation, that we would be able to reduce the size of the generator, the compressors that we were purchasing for that, and save energy in that way. And so we we lent the IET funds to that project. Yeah, it's cool that your tax takes into account that additionality issue of mm-hmm. sometimes these programs and policies that are set up. The concern is that. These are things that would have happened anyway. You're just giving incentives now to do something that would have done anyway. And the way this internal tax is set up, you're saying that they take care to make sure that the money they've generated from the internal tax goes to something additional to what the company was going to do anyway. So that's really cool. Yeah. And I would say in practice, it's difficult. It's very hard. I think as we're trying to manage budgets and something's over budget, we have to cut costs. Um, It's difficult to sometimes not be tempted to say, let's cut that because we know that the tax will cover it. Mm -hmm. Um, So we have had those conversations and we continue to work through that together and be really diligent um, towards creating additionality. So I think what's so cool, and I mean, from these examples of like, you know, buying the wind power at a premium and this internal energy tax, you guys are literally putting your money where your mouth is and like really backing up this commitment. So like in talking to you, it sounds like these are all really cool, you know, almost like company wide perspectives on like how we run this company more efficiently. Um, so that's a really cool perspective, but also like, you know, New Belgium is a brewery and you guys make awesome beer. So like, what are some examples of measures you guys have as a company have taken to make your beer more sustainable? Um, well, I would say we always start with efficiency. Uh, anytime that we can reduce a watt use, it's actually more sustainable than purchasing um, some solar panels to feed into that. So we've done a lot. We have natural daylighting in almost every room of both breweries, uh, which is a great uh, way to save money, save emissions, and make a more enjoyable work env- environment. Um, and then we have invested in the efficiency of our brew houses. Uh, both of our brew kettles are pretty unique. Um, in Fort Collins, uh, there's a technology that... Uh, it's a, a broader boiler plate, and so it, it actually uh, heats up the beer in half the amount of time that uh, a normal boiler would. And then in, for, in Asheville, we have a brew kettle that uses medium temperature hot water that generates its um, energy from pressure rather than heat through steam. So that's, I think, we're maybe the only medium temperature hot water brew kettle in North America. Um, which you have is a, a really picture nerdy of you in thing. front of the kettle? Yeah, I know. <laughs> like you're on two Facebook. Thumbs yeah, up, two, oh. cheering, cheersing. I'm all about the two yeah. thumbs up. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so another thing that I thought was so cool is that you guys capture the steam that comes off of these brew kettles and reuse that. Is that correct? Right, yeah. That's so cool. I mean, that's a very, like, you know, closed-loop system that you guys are able to, to use in your breweries. Both breweries um, capture a lot of waste heat, uh, and we – are swapping waste cold, waste heat um, all throughout the brewing process. Um, lots, of, I could nerd out on that topic for <laughs> a of hours. Well, do you think customers care? Like when they're at the bar and they settle up and they, they're deciding what beer to get, aren't they really just choosing New Belgium because it tastes perhaps better than the others? Do you really think some are like, well, they capture a lot of steam. <laughs> right. Give me the New Belgium. <laughs> right? um, I, you know, working in sustainability, of course, like I wish – that everybody cared uh, in that way. And and that was a part of their decision making process at the bar. But, um, but as we know, and as I I feel the same way myself, when it's time to have a beer, sometimes you want to just not worry about the woes of the world and just relax and and take your mind off of it. So, um, so we don't see um, a lot of the same trends in the alcohol sector that you see in food. For example, when mothers are choosing the right food for their children. Um, when, it, when it comes to alcohol, that's the place where people usually like to disconnect. That said, once people come and hear of our story, we, we've, ha- we've had a lot of feedback from customers saying that they buy more of our beer and are more loyal to New Belgium because they are really um, supportive and, and inspired by the ways that we put their money to use, right? And that we support a healthier environment and healthy society. 
Yeah, and perhaps some of the impact comes at the employee level, right? Like they feel better about coming into work because the company has this ethos and takes those sort of actions and then they want to work harder and better for a company that takes those actions. So like you're saying, some customers hear the story, they buy more. Right. Um, but perhaps the benefit as a company comes in at the employee engagement level. Right. Yeah, and I, w- I would say that although we are charging ourselves a premium on our energy and making these investments, um, you know, we pay full t- full benefits for coworkers, et cetera, a lot of, like, employee benefits. Even though on an, a balance sheet that looks like a, a higher direct cost, we still feel like those investments indirectly pay off in the long run so that we are more profitable, not in spite of our social and environmental efforts, but because of them. And um, and you, you'll hear other speakers right today and tomorrow that are talking about having a sense of purpose and how meaningful that is to one's motivation level, the kind of work they produce, how long they stay with your company. Um, we have a 95% retention rate. We, we save a lot of money on turnover because, um, because of the culture that we create. And, and a big part of that is knowing that we're serving something beyond ourselves. We're making a positive impact. Um, Katie, maybe... Tell us briefly about the Bright Ideas program that you guys have, where, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, employees within New Belgium can submit ideas relative to sustainability that maybe the company can integrate. So how has that problem, or I'm sorry, how has that program been, and have you ever gotten these suggestions that are just like so outlandish that you're just like, I, you know, I don't even know what that means? <laughs> so that, that program, it's evolving now as we're ch- um, changing into a two-site company. There's still... Uh, I, I would say it's just becoming more sophisticated and integrated um, with many departments. Um, and we we still have the employee side where anyone can submit an idea. And um, and I would say we, we do a lot of uh, training for, um, we, we train people on how to read financials. So people have a deep understanding of the business side of what they're proposing. Um, we do a lot of open book management. So people have a direct line of sight into the strategy. So I don't think we get out of this world um, uh, ideas that come in that uh, are totally off base because people have a fair amount of education and exposure walking into it. So what's been one you've used? Uh, one, one that I, I, we've saved a lot of um, material and money from. Um, a couple of our coworkers worked on the packaging line, and they were drinking some non-New Belgium beer with their friends one night, which we all Unacceptable. do. Unacceptable. <laughs> well, you know, the craft brewing industry, like, it's kind of, you, uh, you know, you get, there's merit in trying other beers and, and knowing what's out there. We, def- we definitely support each other um, well as a craft beer industry. But, but they noticed within the beer that they had bought that there was... Um, that there were no cardboard dividers in between the bottles. And uh, we had cardboard divider, a little waffle divider um, in between the bottles. And they, they thought, well, that's also the jamming up the packaging line and all that material and the cost. Um, why do we need it if these guys don't need it? And, um, and it was just something we hadn't thought of before, but because they see a different part of the business every day, it was something they noticed, and they brought the idea to Bright Ideas. Um, we tested it out, had no additional breakage. The bottles support themselves just fine. And over the years, we've, re- we've eliminated all of the cardboard, di- cardboard dividers in our boxes, and we save um, almost a million dollars a year. And that's wow. not that's just from not, getting rid of the cardboard. Device. That's just incredible. from the the um, cost of the materials. That's not counting the savings from being able to fit an extra row of beer on the truck, or um, reducing the leading cause of downtime on our packing packaging line. Wow. Uh, we save uh, hundreds of tons of cardboard from ever being manufactured uh, in the first place. And and these are ideas that are coming from people that are working with the equipment every day. That was a bright idea. I hope that person got a promotion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we all we, we share we get profit sharing, so we all gave each other. You know, they were getting enough. some major. High fives there for a while. <laughs> okay, so our last question for you is: you know, we're here at a Net Impact, and we go to a, a happy hour with a bunch of other Net Impact folks, and we want to tell them about New Belgium Brewing and how it's sustainable. What is one fact from beer brewing generally, or how New Belgium operates, that we should tell them that will cause them to just like freak out? Be like, oh my god, that's amazing. <laughs> Um, gosh, there are so many things. So about sustainability. Hmm. Or New um, Belgium, just yeah, anything. We're 100% employee-owned, uh, which I think is a really cool thing. Uh, you know, we've heard a lot of talks um, at this conference about inclusion, and, um, and I think that the growing wage gap is, uh, is a big issue uh, in our society. And, um, and 
So the fact that all of us who are working to help build New Belgium are um, acquiring equity along the way and sharing in the profits every year, I think it started is one really system-wide shift that can help to close that gap over time. So um, if you have, we have coworkers that work in nearly every state in the U.S. So t technically, we're kind of local in those regions. Uh, we give one dollar of every barrel of beer sold to nonprofits that are working on water stewardship. Um, uh, good climate practices, uh, sustainable agriculture, bicycle advocacy, and smart development. And so, so by purchasing New Belgium, we have a dedication towards putting money towards closing that wage gap, um, building equity through uh, the lower and middle classes, and then also um, giving back to the resources that provide for us. Wait, so a dollar of every what that's sold? So a barrel of beer. Barrel, okay. A barrel. So a bigger keg is a half barrel. Okay. Um, I, you know, this is like these old ways of measuring beer <laughs> volumes, but um, it's, it's thir 31 gallons. But So for every uh, barrel of beer we sell, $1 goes into a philanthropy fund. Um, we've given away $8 million over the years. And um, and if you have a nonprofit that's related to any of those categories I mentioned, or you know of someone that does, they can apply through our grant system on our website. Um, and we have a we have uh, committees throughout the company. Anyone who works at New Belgium can help make those decisions about who we fund. So collective decision-making, collective good. <laughs> I also just love how bike advocacy was thrown in there, given that Fat Tire is such an awesome yeah. beer. Yeah. <laughs> um, excellent. Yeah. And so if people want to learn more, what is the website? www.newbelgium.com. Okay. All right. and, and, and where can they find you? Kate, are you on Twitter? Um, LinkedIn, where can people find you? Um, on LinkedIn. Okay. Yep. And, uh, and happy to, um, you know, share more. And we're just, we're really excited to be here at Net Impact, um, meeting all of our future colleagues in the space. And uh, it's really inspiring to see um, what people are dreaming about right now. And I look forward to seeing that manifest. Katie, thank you so much for joining us. Maybe we'll um, catch up later up for a fat tie or two. Oh, I hope so. Thanks. Nice. All right. Thanks, Katie. See ya. All right, Scott, this episode has run out of steam, and unlike New Belgium Brewing Company, we do not have a machine that can recapture that steam and actually turn it into something useful. Maybe one day we will get a sponsor, and they'll be like, all right, what are you going to use our money for? A uh, steam, steam capture. capture. <laughs> <laughs> We're waiting for that New Belgium endorsement yeah. for this podcast. All right, so we want to thank the very talented Emily Dubois for uh, doing our logo. We should ask her, like, how if people like her logo, how they can get in touch with her? We yeah, do that in the next yeah. Episode. Stay tuned for get her some biz. Yeah, for some contact information. Hopefully, all right. Up. So Emily Dubois, and then also the musicians, uh, Square Peg Round Hole for the transition music and the outro music, and then also um, potions for our intro music. If you haven't already, please subscribe to our feed on iTunes. Rate, review us, and share us with all of your friends. Uh, and reach out. Let us know if there's something you want us to cover. Uh, there's something we could be doing better, even though there might not be anything, because we're just killing it out here. Um, nah, th that's there's not probably, true. There's plenty that's not true. Maybe more drinking games um, for each intro. Uh, but please reach out. Let us know. We would love to hear from you. And so to do that, our email is hosts, H-O-S-T-S, at sustainabilitydefined.com. We're also on Twitter, uh, Facebook, all the interwebs. Just, just search for us. We should give out something. Like, first person to email us gets, like... A shout out on the next episode. Yeah, All I right. like so that. Starting, starting, well, that. starting now. Fuck it. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> fuck it. Um, so please reach out. We'd love to hear from you. Um, and Scott, I think and we'll give you a shout out. Yeah, we'll give you a shout the, out for the first person that emails us. Yeah. All right, Scott. I think that's uh, I think that's it. All right. I'm Scott Breen. You all stay sustainable out there. I'm Jay Siegel. We will see you next time. <laughs>